Welcome to Casual Friday. Last week I showed you a pair of socks I was working on for my daughter and they were just about finished and I have finished them. I threw them in the wash along with the little socks that I knit for the five-year-old that she's an au pair for. And as I expected, the both socks got softer in the wash. And sock yarn tends to have 25% nylon content, so it can be a little stiff sometimes when you're knitting it. Not super stiff, but it can just feel a little firmer, especially since you're knitting at a firm gauge. But they always soften up in the wash. So now these socks were knit with, so these socks were Regia Perfect. So I use Regia yarns a lot. I really like them. Uh, they they soften up in the wash and they just are really hard wearing socks. I, I, I don't think any of my socks knit from Regia have ever worn out and the colorways, they, I tend to like the striping colorways that they come up with. So these softened as I expected. Well, I took these, I, I wash my socks in the washing machine on gentle and then I have a wooden lingerie rack where I hang like my bras and things that are supposed to be dry, not supposed to be tumble dried. So I hang the, the socks on there. I took these off the rack and I couldn't believe how soft they were, like especially with the side-by-side -side comparison of two just finished pairs of socks just washed at the same time. And I, and I thought, geez, these remind me of Cascade Heritage in terms of how soft the yarn is. So I went and I looked at the labels of both of them and Cascade Heritage is merino wool and nylon and so is this yarn. I didn't mention this last week. I want to talk a little bit about the yarn I used for that uh, pair of socks. I bought that yarn when I was in the Netherlands. I bought two balls of the sock yarn at a shop in Leiden and I like to I like to buy sock yarn because I only have to buy one ball and it fits packs easily. And I like to choose things that I haven't seen before, um, that I haven't seen in the shops in my area before, that I hadn't heard of before. And so this is the other ball of the sock yarn that I bought. It's the same type of colorway, just different colors. And the company is Ferner Vol or I'll put it on the screen because I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly. It's an Austrian yarn. She had told me it was from Austria. So when, since I had never knit with this yarn before, I like to kind of do a little bit of research in terms of what other, what kind of gauge other people are getting with their yarns. I look at the gauge on the ball band and I know that the ball band gauge recommendation is based on a stockinette sweater that's sort of the standard for how gauge is recommended on ball bands. Even though this is marketed as a sock yarn, gauge on the ball band is going to be based on a stockinette sweater. And for socks, you want to knit to a firmer gauge. You don't want drape in your socks. You want something that's going to stand up that will have to stretch to fit and isn't going to just stretch out and fall down your legs. So typically the idea is you're going to knit it one to two stitches per inch firmer than whatever the ball band s states on the on the label. This didn't have a gauge listed. So it just had needles. It said 3.5 to 4 and so that's millimeters. So that would be like a US 4 to size 6. Needle size, in my opinion, is the least helpful bit of information that you can get on a ball band or in a pattern. It's not that it's unhelpful, but it's the least helpful. What you need to know is what the gauge is that you're supposed to get. So I had to kind of think about it and I couldn't compare it directly to any sock yarn I had in my stash. So this is a sport weight yarn. So it's a thicker yarn than you'd use, you know, like uh, the fingering weight yarns that you use uh, for, for socks. This is a little bit thicker than that. So some countries will call the fingering weight sock yarn a four ply yarn and some countries will call, and then the thicker yarn they call six ply yarn. And that may or may not have to do with how many plies are actually in the yarn. It's based on when machine spinning first started, there was sort of a standard uh, w a thickness of, of a single that was made by machine. And then those singles were plied together to form different yarn weights. So two 
strand, two singles would be plied together to make a two ply and that's lace weight. You would do four plies to have a fingering weight. You'd have six plies to make a sport weight, eight ply to make a DK. DK stands for double knitting. So if four ply yarn was what you would normally knit things like socks or things like that, you could double fingering weight yarn and get DK weight yarn. So that's what an eight, eight ply yarn would be. So Australia and maybe some, I don't know if New Zealand does, but I know for sure Australia refers to yarn weights based on this ply system. And again, these days we don't have a standard single uh, width for when we're plying something together. You could have a super bulky yarn that's a single, that's a single ply, or you could have a fingering weight yarn that has, you know, multi plies that might have eight or more plies in them. So you can't, the actual number of plies may not be, have anything to do with the yarn weight that's called six ply. So I have three different balls of yarn that are this sport weight, as we would call it in the U.S., yarn. Um, that would could be considered six ply yarn. So one of them is Cascade Heritage Prints. That's a US yarn. It's manufactured in China. And I just know from the Cascade Heritage fingering weight yarn, their sock yarn, tends to be a little bit thinner than other four ply sock yarns, fingering weight sock yarns. So this one has something like a 450 meters of yarn in this 150 gram ball of yarn and that's 492 yards. So this one I got in the Netherlands that's Austrian has 425 meters which is about 460 yards so it's a little bit less than what you get in here. And then I have Regia six ply yarn and this one only has 375 meters so this one you can tell when you can tell the thickness. You may not be able to tell comparing these two together by just by, by feel but you can definitely tell the Regia is thicker. Now one of the things that I just noticed <laughs> was that this Austrian yarn is labeled six fach, F-A-C-H. And I've seen that before and I've always thought, oh, that means six ply. And, but the Regia yarn says six, and I can't pronounce this word, fit, I, I tried to get a pronunciation from Google Translate, but uh, it wasn't <laughs> successful. And then right under there, it says six ply. So I looked up what does six fach mean? And it, it means six fold. And in the vintage patterns I've been looking at lately, a lot of times they'll recommend a yarn and it'll say, use Germantown fourfold yarn for this pattern or use, you know, some such an eightfold. And I thought, what does that even mean? Is that plies? Is that what they're talking about? So I would be curious because Regia is a German sock yarn manufactured in Italy and Ferner Wolle is an Austrian yarn, which I believe is actually manufactured in Austria from what it looks like. But I'm just wondering if that's just a variation in the German language from Austria to Germany about whether you use six fach versus fiddig, I don't know how to pronounce that. But if someone could tell me if there's a difference, like what does that mean? So when I'm knitting socks with a sock yarn I've never knit with before, I look at the ball band, what is the recommended gauge? Okay, I'm going to knit one to two stitches per inch firmer than that. And so what needle will I probably need for that? Now, when I am knitting the recommended gauge, the actual recommended gauge on the ball band, I pretty much know what needle I will need um, to knit that. But when I'm knitting at a firmer gauge than what the ball band recommends, I can't always completely predict what needle I'm going to use because there's a limit to how much you can squeeze things in. So I know what I need to knit seven stitches per inch if that's the recommended gauge. But if I'm using a yarn that's recommended at five and a half stitches per inch and I want to knit seven stitches per inch, I may or may not be able to use that same needle that I use to get seven stitches stitches per inch on a yarn that's supposed to be knit on seven stitches per inch. So there, so I usually start with what gauge do I want and then what needle will I probably need and then I'll, I'll, I'll try that out. And usually I can get pretty close but my gauge may not be exactly what I was 
thinking I was going to get, it might be instead of seven and a half stitches per inch, I might get 7.75 stitches per inch or 7.25 stitches per inch. You know, it just might be a little bit off. So, but once I know what my actual gauge is with that needle, then I can determine how many stitches I actually need to cast on based on who it is I'm knitting for. I was really struggling with this at first. I was looking to see what other people, what gauges that they had knit this at. And nobody listed that in their projects. They would list the needle size they use or the number of stitches they cast on or sometimes both of those, but they would never list the gauge. And I found that really interesting. So the most important thing in knitting a sock is what your gauge is. So that was the thing that I, I found most puzzling. So in the future, I'll look at my previous project knit with this particular brand of yarn. And I'll look at what needle size I use and then what gauge I got with that needle. And then based on the size of the ankle or the foot that I'm gonna be knitting for, then I can determine my cast on number. So I'm knitting a pillow for my daughter who just moved to Chicago, a little accessory for her bed. And I found a pattern I really liked. It's a free pattern. I'll link down in the, in the in description below. So the front and the back are different. So the back, I finished the back. So the back is just a slip stitch pattern. So it's like knit three, slip one, every right side row, and then you just purl on the wrong side. So that's very simple. And then I just started the front of the pillow. Over here, it's the same, the same thing. It's that slip stitch pattern, but on this half of the pillow, it's this, it's like a, some type of brioche, but, there, but this, this particular pattern isn't doing, you know, yarn over and slipping and, and then working together and doing another yarn over like most brioche patterns do instead. You uh, purl the wrong side rows and on the right side rows, you are uh, knitting below into the previous stitch and that's offset. So like row two, will have knit below, knit one, knit below, knit one. And then row four, they'll be offset from that. So whatever had been knit below, two rows below is knit and it's just, it's just on the opposite. So it's a nice little pattern. The pattern is written for Aran weight yarn and an 18 inch pillow. So I have a 14 inch pillow and I'm using worsted weight yarn. And I can't remember the name of the yarn. I'll look it up and put it on the screen. So because the size is different and the yarn weight is different, my stitch counts are different. Um, but it's, an, it's a nice pattern and it's pretty easy. It's knit, you know, you knit the two squares and you have to sew them together. I had spent some time thinking about avoiding having to do seams by starting with a closed cast on and knitting in the round. There's just too many different variations on what I needed to do to make that happen. And I thought the seams are gonna help keep the sides uh, lined up and straight. So I decided to go ahead and, and, and do the seams. We'll see how, and we'll see if I regret that later. I figured out how I'm going to actually do my button closures on the Edwardian sweater and I've been practicing. I'm going to do these button loops. I kind of decided I wanted to do button loops a few weeks ago and I was, pr I was trying to do it with the yarn that I used to knit the sweater. And I could see that was not going to work well. It was too thick and too fuzzy. It just, I, I could tell it wasn't going to work. And the fact that I'd be attaching the button loops to the actual knitted fabric, I thought it was just gonna stretch out. So I was looking for a different solution. So I kept looking um, at ways of doing these button loops and I found on Isolde Teague's website, she showed how to do these same button loops, but using embroidery floss. And she was demonstrating it on a little piece of fabric. And then that gave me an idea for doing the button loops in um, what it's called like seam seaming tape. It's um, it's like folded over. Maybe it's for, used for quilting. I don't know, but it's it's like a, it's a piece of fabric that that is all folded up, and you use it to maybe you use you use it to bind the edges of quilts. I, I'm not sure what it's used for. I use it for other things, but I thought this would be a great way you do the button loop in this woven fabric so it's not going to pull the woven fabric isn't going to stretch out like the loops of knitting wood the knitted fabric would so i'm doing i found some embroidery floss that perfectly matched 
um, the sweater. And I'm, I'm figuring out some ways how I want to actually close the edges here because it's folded over. So right here, I'm going to have two buttons, these little pearl buttons. And then on this side, I'm going to do the loops. These are just practice ones. These aren't the right size. I'm going to put these loops inside where it's folded so that they'll stick out. And then I will, and then they'll just stick out there. I'll do this in the overhead so you can see better. Um, but I've, I've been playing with how to determine how to get the right loop size because in these tutorials they tend to say, oh, you're going to loop the yarn or the floss over your finger and it takes some trial and error to get the right size. And so I, I've been using uh, knitting needles of different sizes to determine how big that loop is going to be. And you basically, you're tying a series of knots around the edge to create this really pretty looking loop. And so I did one that was too small, then I did one that was too big, and then I figured out, you know, okay, my next one I'm going to use a knitting needle that's exactly the size of this little pearl button. It's seven millimeters. I use a seven, seven millimeter knitting needle to establish the size of the loop, and we'll see if that works. So one, once I've gotten the exact size of the loop that I need, then I'll demonstrate a probably maybe for next week, might be a couple of weeks, I'm not sure, um, but I'll show you that in the future. But I was really happy that I came up with a solution that I think is actually going to look nice because the neck is going to be where everybody sees it. I wanted to make sure it looked really, really good. So last weekend in the United States was Mother's Day on Sunday. But in Minnesota, two other things happen on Mother's Day weekend. One is that it's the fishing opener. <laughs> As a concession to those kind of conflicting events, the state of Minnesota will grant a free one-day fishing license to mothers on Mother's Day, which is not something that has ever excited me. What has excited me is the other event that goes on in Minnesota, on Mother's Day weekend, and that is Shepherd's Harvest. So Shepherd's Harvest is our fiber festival. I think this was the 22nd annual Shepherd's Harvest event. It's in Washington County, which is a couple of counties east of where I am. It's just outside the Twin Cities, outside of St. Paul. And it's right on the, Washington County is on the St. Croix River, and the St. Croix River is the border between Minnesota and Wisconsin. So you get a lot of people from Wisconsin will come to this event as well. So in the early years, I think my first time going to Shepherd's Harvest was right around 2006. So I think they, the first year was 1998. And I remember those early years when I went and I realized that the event wasn't really something that was geared toward the type of fiber arts person that I was. I would go every year, but I realized over time, this is not really for me. Now that's changed. A lot of things have changed about Shepherd's Harvest, but also have changed about me. So in the early years, I think the earliest years, they had one exhibit barn that was for vendors, demonstrations, like of knitting and spinning and things like that and that is also where they had the fleece competition so the shepherds who come to shepherd's harvest can enter competition with fleece so it's and there's a judge there so it's judged based on category of sheep and they have all these criteria how many points you get out of that and then that happens on Saturday morning and then on Saturday afternoon from 1 to 3, they have a silent auction. So you can bid on those fleece and you can see the judging sheets and you can see if it won a ribbon or, or whatever. So I was always sort of mildly interested in that, but I wasn't a spinner. I wasn't interested in spinning. I wasn't going to buy any of them. I didn't know anything about, you know, wool at that, that, in that state. But it, so it used to be that everything was in one barn when they first started. I'm saying barn. It's like an exhibit hall. And then they also had actual barns with stalls where they would have um, 
fiber producing animals. They have sheep and alpaca and goats and all kinds of, and all kinds of things. And the farmers who were, had their animals in the barn, then they, they might also sell some of their products. And then out in the fields, they would have sheep herding demonstrations and, and things like that. And then there's a food hall. It's a, it's a county fairground, so there's a food hall and they have food in there. And then there's a couple of food trucks type of things that are there these days as well. So there's a lot, you know, there's things going on, you know, all over the place. But it's, it's, it's pretty small in terms of, you know, it doesn't take a lot of walking, but the exhibit halls are pretty big and there are a lot of vendors in there. So again, at the beginning, there was one exhibit hall that had uh, vendors, demos, and the silent auction uh, fleece competition. At some point after I started going there, they were in two exhibit halls. But and again, the demos were in amongst all the vendors. So the Minnesota Knitters Guild would have a booth there amongst all of the vendors. And I remember volunteering years ago, and not really getting many people stopping by the booth at that time. So the vendors that they have, some of them are selling raw fleece that they've you know, produced on their farm. Some of them are selling processed fiber, like um, comb top or dyed combed top, things like that. They might be selling yarn that was that was made from their animals. I remember one year, one of the early years I went there, there was an alpaca farmer who they had yarn made from their alpacas. And then you'll see uh, like independent dyers at that time. That was like, it was in the early years of independent dyers for um, for yarn and they were <laughs> at that time they were doing a lot of high contrast colors in the same skein and you'd look at the skein it would be really pretty and then you'd buy it and then be like it would be impossible to knit with because of the way the colors uh, interacted or pooled or flashed so that was the early years of those so I remember seeing like these big walls of indie dyed yarn and going, I'm, I'm not going by it. Cause I had made that mistake before going, Oh, that's so pretty. And then not working out in when I was knitting it. Then they also have vendors that, that have tools like spindles or spinning wheels. Sometimes they'll have vendors from some of the local yarn shops will have a booth there. And there was one year where the shop where I taught had a booth and I was helping out at that booth. So you have some of those and you'll have, you know, just, it's just a variety of things. People who make baskets, people who make soap and so, or selling hand, handmade soap. So, but in those early years, it was really, I really realized this is not for me because I'm not a yarn stasher. So even if it was commercial yarn, I'm not, if I don't know what I can knit with it, if I, if I don't have a project in mind, I don't want to buy yarn because it'll just sit there. And that's actually the problem I had with that alpaca yarn. I'm like, oh, alpaca. This is, I'd never knit with alpaca. This is you know, almost 15 years ago. So I was so excited that it was the farmer and it was their yarn and it was alpaca and, and I bought it and it was in this natural brown color, which is not a color I knit with. I didn't know anything about knitting with alpaca. It was in a yarn weight that I never knit with. And so it has sat there for almost 15 years. So I just learned over time, I am not the kind of knitter who can go to one of these markets, you know, like when there's a knitting event and, and just buy yarn. It's not me. And I wasn't a spinner. So I really felt like this wasn't a place that made sense for me. I would still go on average, probably I average every other year, but in those early years, I was going every year. And then in the past few years, I hadn't been at all until last year. And what changed for me last year was that I had decided I wanted to try knitting with other, with, with yarns made from other breeds. And I was, wasn't having much luck just at yarn shops finding much other than Merino and, and BFL and maybe a couple of other things. But there really wasn't a lot out there. Maybe Shetland wool you could find sometimes, but there just, it, it just wasn't something I could find. So I thought, well, Shepherd's Harvest, that would be the place for me to find these yarns made from other breeds. And so I was walking through the vendor hall and I wasn't really seeing a lot of yarns from, from different um, breeds. What I was seeing was the combed top, uh, raw wool, and then there were these booths where they would have, they called, I don't know, long locks or whatever. So they were uh, things, uh, they were 
locks of fleece from long wool breeds. And apparently people who make art and yarn a lot of times like to just spin those in there so they hang off. So sometimes some of them were dyed and some of them were undyed. But there was this one booth I walked into where I saw these little bundles of one ounce long locks of different breeds. And they were all prettily just, you know, they were on display in, in, in like this. And I walked up and I thought, oh, this is so interesting. Look at this, this, this uh, lock, this kind of wavy like this. And oh, this is what Icelandic wool looks like. This is what they mean when they say they have guard hair and this other kind of uh, wool underneath. And um, I was just starting to understand what I was had been reading about in terms of the qualities of different uh, wool breeds. And then the woman came over and I was telling her about, I'm like, oh, I'm finally I'm starting to understand it. And she, she had a big bag of some kind of wool and she pulled out something that was very tightly waved like this. And I said, oh my gosh, it looks like it was uh, ironed with a crimping iron. And that was when the light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, oh, that's why they call it crimp. Because I had seen wool fleeces described as it has this kind of crimp or that kind of crimp. And I didn't understand what it meant. Because when you get yarn that's been processed by a mill, you can't really see what the crimp of the wool, but you can't see how long the staple is. You can't see anything about anything that is recognizable in terms of what kind of sheep it came from. You can't see that. So that was when I realized, oh, I need to learn how to spin. That will, it, I'll be able to, to see how the, what the crimp is like, how long the staple length is. I'll be able to tell what it feels like. Then I'll understand better what the different qualities of wool were. So I was standing in that booth and I'm like, I have to learn how to spin. And I'd been avoiding it for 13 years. I told this story last year, but, um, I've been avoiding learning to spin actively for 13 years and I just let all that go and I've got to learn how to spin. So I took spinning, spinning lessons and one of the things that you learn or I learned in my spinning class, first of all, they give you different types of combed top, prepared, it's been washed, it's been um, processed, it's, it's all ready to spin and they give you a couple of ounces of different types of wool and even different types of fiber. You might get cotton, you might get some silk, you might get all, all different kinds of things. You'll get blends and and then they teach you how to spin with it. But one of the things that they're teaching you is that there are different ways to process the, the wool after it's been washed. You can comb it, you can cart it, you can um, do this, you can do that, you can drum cart. There's like all these different ways to process it and then there's all these different ways of drafting the fibers as you spin it. And none of that had ever been apparent to me looking at yarn. And part of that is that when when yarn is milled by a commercial mill or even a mini mill, there's only they have a limited number of ways that they can process it and that they're going to spin it. They're just they're more limited than what you can do by hand. So I was starting to realize that there was even more to it than just you know understanding the breed and then and then seeing what it looked like ahead of time and then spinning it yourself because there's so many different so many different things you can do at each step of the way. So when I was at Ply Away in April and I took a class on drum carding, we were just like in spinning classes, we were provided with fiber. In this case, it was cleaned already. Like in our spinning class, they would give us also a few ounces, like an ounce of this kind of wool and that kind of wool and this other kind of wool. And we learned how to wash it and how, how to process it, but only like an ounce of it. So in the drum carding class, we were given an ounce or two of fleece as well, but it had been cleaned already. And so you didn't have to worry about that part of it. You could still see how the locks were formed, what kind of crimp, how long the staple length was. You could see all of that and feel it. And then we were carding it and I started realizing in that class, oh, what I want to buy is clean fleece because I was a little intimidated. I didn't want to buy, uh, usually when you're buying raw fleece, you have to buy the whole fleece and that could be seven, eight pounds worth of wool. And 
first of all, I, I was intimidated about cleaning that much of it at one time. I was worried I was going to ruin it. And secondly, what am I going to do with that much of one kind of wool? I'm trying to understand multiple kinds of wool. I really want to do what they call a breed study. So I want a small quantity of a lot of different types of fleece that I can then um, experiment with carding versus combing versus, uh, you know, short forward draft versus long draft or, you know, like all these different kinds of ways and then different ways of applying those things together and, and constructing the yarn that you produce from the single. So there are a lot of different things to play around with. So my goal this year when I went to Shepherd's Harvest was to buy clean fleece. <laughs> and there's not a lot of that there. I mean, you can buy small quantities like I had seen last year where, you know, it's you know, an ounce at a time that's long locks or something, but it just wasn't, I wasn't seeing what I wanted, but I was also really overwhelmed by the number that, of what was going on in terms in the vendor halls. I'm the kind of person who really lives inside my head and I don't pay a lot of attention to what's going on around me. When I go shopping, I think about what I want, I make a list, I go to the store, I go to that department in the store where the thing is that I want to buy and I buy that thing. So I don't have to look at anything else. I don't have to look at the produce in the grocery store if what I want is ice cream. And I know I want vanilla ice cream, so I'm not looking at, you know, every brand and every flavor. I, you know, I, I kind of think about what it is I want ahead of time and then that's what I go get. So I walk into these vendor halls and there is everything. <laughs> And they're all one after the other. It's just like overwhelming to me. And the first exhibit hall I went in, the vendor hall, I thought, geez, this doesn't seem like a lot of fiber being sold here. But there's yarn being sold and there's a lot of fiber related items being sold, but I didn't, wasn't seeing a lot of just fiber. But part of that might have been I was just kind of overwhelmed. So then I went into the second exhibit hall and that's when I'm like, oh, well, here's where the fiber vendors are. And I don't know if that was actually true, if that was planned that way, if that was actually true, that's just my perception. But I, my perception was that the second barn I went into was much more uh, people selling fleece. And a lot of it was raw fleece. And again, it was overwhelming and I'm just, I just wanted to walk through the first time and then I was gonna come back again later. So I was coming around the end of the barn and coming around the corner and back up the other way. And I really, it was like a magnetic force pulling me over <laughs> to this table. And there was this bag of beautiful sort of silvery gray fleece with some oatmeal kind of colored mixture in it. And I put my hand in it and you could feel the lanolin. And it looked pretty clean. And, and I was looking to see, well, how much um, is there in there? And it was four pounds and so I was talking to the woman about well how much do you lose with the lanolin because I know it's, it can be up to 50 percent depending on the kind of fleece it is um, and so she's like it's about 35 percent so it was going to be about two and a half pounds remaining and I thought well that's more than I need for a sweater but it gives me enough to play you know enough extra without having double the amount that I need and I was like I wanted to buy that fleece and I don't know anything about buying a fleece and I was like, that's not why I came here. I said to her, well, I told myself I wasn't going to buy a fleece today, <laughs> but I might. Yeah, you hear that, but when you see them, you feel them, it sometimes it's tempting. And, but she was still, like, she, and I said, well, I'm a new spinner. I don't really know what I'm doing. And so she was talking about, well, the staple length isn't too long. It is pretty manageable. And, and I hadn't even considered that. And I said, well, I want to go to the end of the, I just want to finish going to the end of the barn and then I'll come back and if it hasn't been sold yet, I'm going to buy it. And I got to the end of the barn and I'm like, I'm not ready to buy this yet. So I kind of walked outside and the Weaver's Guild had their booth outside on the green grass. And there was a woman there spinning and she was talking to another woman about spinning. And I went over there and I said, could I just ask you a question like how long is the like I'm a newer knitter or a newer spinner and the staple length is maybe this long is that too long for a drum carter and oh no I shouldn't be and and I was just like oh so I but I went back and I bought I bought it and I don't feel bad about it I'm really actually really happy with it so I bought that bag of fleece 
I had signed up to volunteer at the Knitters Guild booth you know, like at 1.15. Well, at 1 o'clock is when the silent auction starts for the uh, flea, after the fleece competition has been uh, judged. And so I had about 15 minutes to kill. So I went through and I was looking and I was like, I, none of this means anything to me. Like they have the different categories, the Shetland or the Romney or the this or the that. And then they have the the sheet of the judging things with the numbers. And I like, I don't know, even know how to interpret like what it is they're judging. And then they each have a silent auction sheet at, uh, next to the bag of fleece. And they'll have a starting bid on there. Like there's the minimum starting bid. And the prices would range from $30 for the bag of fleece, which could vary in weight depending on the size of the sheep and all that kind of stuff. But then there was one that was like a starting bid of $150. And I'm like, no, there's this, this whole other category of things to think about that I know nothing about in terms of buying raw fleece. And so I'm like, I was like really happy that I didn't even know any of that when I bought that other fleece. And me, it turned out to have been a terrible mistake to have bought that fleece. I don't know. I don't know what the quality of it is. Um, the fleece that I bought was also a crossbreed. And I think the things that were judged are maybe full breeds, I think. The fleece that I bought was a quarter Romney and three quarters Blue Face Luster. And those are both breeds I had heard of before. And I've, and I've knit even with Blue Face Luster before. So... So that helped me a little bit. So, but I went through that and I'm like, well, I'm not gonna buy anything. I already bought a fleece and I don't understand any of this. This is like more confusing to me. It's not like, it's not as helpful as you would think it would be because I know so little. So I went to the Knitter's Guild booth and I was doing my shift and I had such a good time. I, I, I really would say that, that this Shepherd's Harvest was the most fun I have ever had because it's now aimed at me. I am a spinner and I there there is more there that I am interested in and learning more. I, I it's a lot of it's still over my head, but it's still at least it's things that, that interest me and that I want to learn more about. Well one of the great things about you know past couple of years I've been trying to um, get more involved in the knitting community and then when I learned to spin I knew I want to get involved in the spinning community right away and I'd gone to this retreat at the at the that the uh, Weaver's Guilds put on and I'd met several people there at that retreat who have knitting groups that they've invited me to. So one, one of them is the Wednesday knitting group I go to weekly and then the other one is one I go to once a month on Fridays. Well the woman who runs that once a month knitting group stopped by the table and I was you know chatting with her. I hadn't seen her in a while because i had been on my, on my travels lately and I was talking to her and she she was off to go to the silent auction and see you know what what there was there. Well about 20 minutes to three one of the people running the silent auction started coming around to the different um, booths in this demo ex exhibit hall and said only 20 more minutes left in the silent auction and there's a lot of fleeces that nobody has bid on including some that have won ribbons and you should really you should really go there and I was like Oh, but I really don't know how I don't know what to do I'm a new spinner she's and so she's like selling me on well this is the right breed you should look at and you should get and you, you know so I was like oh so you peer pressured me okay I'm gonna go I'm gonna go look again so I went in there and Celeste the woman who runs the knitting group that I did was in there and she came over and said hi I said Celeste you have to help me I don't understand any of this and I don't know that I want to buy another fleece but I I don't even I don't even know how to how to approach this and she's like oh well I put a bit on a poly pal fleece over there but the one that I really want it's just it's too expensive unless I I split it with someone and I said well what what one is that and she brought it over and brought me over and then she was showing me the judging sheet and how to kind of go through and and, and evaluate you know what what each thing means and and how some sometimes that's more important to one person than it might be to another and and so I said, well, I'll split it with you. And so we were looking at what the weight was and if we divided it and then eliminate it and then, you know, subtracted the amount of lanolin that would be washed out, what would we be left with? And, oh, it would be enough for each of us to knit a sweater from it. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll go in on it with you. I said, but I have, can you help me wash it? Because I, 
I have just bought this other fleece and I'm really scared to wash it because I don't want it to felt. And she's and then she's like, oh, sure, I can help you with that. I've washed at least 100 fleeces uh, in my time. And then she told me how she washes fleeces and the equipment that she uses to do it. And I thought, oh, my God, that is the most amazing thing. So what she does is she and this is a, a thing I'd never seen before. It's a kitty litter box. So it has two regular kitty litter trays, and then it has one tray that has basically a screen in it. This is not a type of tray that was available when I got my last cat 25 years ago, and certainly I never bought another kitty litter tray for him in the 20 years that he was alive. So, and I haven't bought one since because I don't have a cat. So the idea is that you have uh, the solid litter box, the screen, and then you have a solid litter box on top. So you have them stacked that way. And in the top solid litter box, you have the cat litter. And then when you want to clean it, you lift up that solid litter box, and you dump it into the other one that's got the screen in it. You lift up the screen that's got all of the poop and everything in it, and that you dump that out. And then you put that one in the empty litter box, and then you stack the one that's full of the cleaned litter on top. So what she does with this system for cleaning fleece is that she fills up one of the solid litter boxes with the detergent and the hot, hot water. She lays the, the locks of fleece on the screen, and then she sets it into the pan of hot water and then gently presses it so that the wool will go under the surface of the water. And then she leaves for 30, 40 minutes um, so she, that she's not like touching it and messing with it. And then she comes back and she lifts that screen tray, just lifts it out of the dirty water and then she fills up the empty one with super hot water and then she puts it in that one to rinse it. And I'm like, that is genius. So I ordered one of these kitty litter boxes and then I'm going to go to her house probably in a couple of weeks and then we're going to do this together. And I'm just so happy I have a mentor to kind of walk me through all of this. And then she said, well, have you ever dyed fleece? And I said, no, I've dyed comb top that was sort of a disaster. <laughs> and she said, oh, well, I'll show you how to do that too. I buy old crock pots from yard sales and I use those um, to make dye pots with. I'll show you how to do that too. So I'm super excited that um, that she's going to help me with this and help walk me through this because that's what I need. I just need someone to kind of walk me through it so that I feel confident and I can ask questions. And if I'm unsure, she, you know, she can stop me from making a disastrous mistake or reassure me and say, no, 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 that's fine. So I'm really happy about that. So that was my weekend at Shepherd's Harvest. Now, I had asked you guys in the past week or so to leave me questions that I would answer, and I've been collecting those, and I've been thinking about the answers to them, and some of them are going to take some talking through, and so I didn't want to do that in this episode because I just it, it, thought it was made too long. So I'll, I'm going to probably be answering. I'll try to answer one question per week, especially the longer ones. The shorter ones I can just maybe answer, but it seems like I always have... A lot more to say about something. I never have a quick answer to anything. So uh, I'm going to be uh, adding those uh, answers to questions uh, in the next few weeks uh, ongoing. So whenever you have a question that you want answered, um, just go ahead and leave that down in the comments or on my Ravelry group. So anytime you have a question that you want answered, it's more like maybe it's more of a generic question. It isn't a very specific, how do you do this particular technique, but something that's uh, maybe a little bit broader topic, like how to approach something or how do I do something, go ahead and ask that. And then I just collect these questions. I have a, a document where I just collect these questions and then I'll try answering them uh, as I can going forward. So that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.